My name is Coyote Peterson, and I've traveled the world seeking out the most fascinating animals on our planet. Look at that! No matter the location, my mission has always been the same. To get up close and uncover the secrets of the creatures that we often misunderstand, even worse, fear. Every animal has a story, and I brave the wild to tell it. How pumped are you guys right now? This is pretty awesome. You see him, he's right over there, right? All right. I'm gonna talk about him for about two minutes like he's not right over there, okay? That's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna do an amazing intro. Hey, my name's Matt Forte. I'm a host on Build Series, which is a show you might have seen by accident on Fios One. And, uh, but we do a ton of shows, and I'm super pumped to be here uh, tonight. This is really cool. I'm thrilled hosting a very special panel featuring the newest and most exciting talent to come to Animal Planet. Coyote Peterson is here, ladies and gentlemen. Round of applause. And you know him best, as 15 million YouTube subscribers know him best, as the King of Sting. Second only to actual Sting, but I don't think he's a king. He's more of a shaman. Uh, and at any rate, you know him as the King of Sting, and uh, what's happening now, this is incredible. He's going to be on Animal Planet with a show that's going to extend the reach of all the amazing adventures and the message of conservation and animal knowledge, and I'm super excited. We're going to uh, kick it off in just a second. I'm personally a very big fan. I've had a chance to talk to Coyote a couple of times. He's come through, stopped by the studio uh, for his books and stuff, and uh, every time the dude comes through, uh, he just blows us away with incredible stories of his adventure and the things he's seen and the places he's been. He's as close to a real-life Indiana Jones that I've ever met, uh, and I'm very excited to hang out and talk to him. Uh, we've got a lot in store for you over the next 60 minutes. Whatever your social media preference of choice, please feel free to share, go nuts, post like crazy. Uh, just do me a favor, tag Animal Planet and Coyote Peterson using the hashtag BraveTheWild in your posts. Uh, other than that... I think we should bring him up here. I think we should start this thing. You guys want to do that? You want to get it going? <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, you followed them on their journey into some of the most remote locations and watched them encounter some of the scariest looking animals head on. You felt their passion, energy, fear, and excitement as they document some of the craziest animal encounters ever captured. Now, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please here to share firsthand their wildlife adventures. Welcome the team to the stage. Do it up. Make some noise. Come on. Get on up here. Come on. Get on up here. One. All right. After What's up, guys? Whoa, that's loud. Keep applauding while they take their seats. Come on, let's. Can we play musical microphones and just like section through? You want to? Since we have so many of them. Yeah. I feel like we should just rotate from microphone to microphone. We have all of them on and turned all the way up. That's, that's the what right we've done. way to go. Yeah. So we. <laughs> Uh, I'm super excited to have everybody here. Thank you so much. Of course, closest to me, joining me right here. You guys, uh, how much more do I need to introduce? Coyote Peterson is with me tonight. Uh, we've got, yes, Mario Aldecoa is here, executive producer and showrunner. David Casey is here, and Animal Planet executive producer, Faye Yu. Uh, just one more time, get that blood flowing. Uh, so I just want to start off real quick. You guys... You really are. At the end of the day, you are fearless, uh, fun, entertainment. The entire family, you've achieved such great success spreading your message and the uh, uh, awareness that you've done. It's incredible work. Uh, and now, again, that message only going further with Animal Planet. I want to start, though, I want to go back for a minute, uh, and I want to talk about how this kind of all began. If we go back about five years, uh, you know, you had a little-known YouTube channel, and now you flash forward to today, and, I mean, you've got two books. You've got the, the oh, you've got more than two books. You've got a bunch of books. You've got the Coyote Pack. Uh, you've got the new TV series. It's just incredible when you think five years ago versus today. Let's start with uh, how this all began for you and what field you were in before this happened and how you think that field got you here today. Do you have a DeLorean that we can fit everybody into? We just go back and we'll, like... Spend five years doing that? On the other side of that wall, there is no less than 43 DeLoreans right now. Yes. I promise you, yes. we can take one of them. 
Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, Mario, you certainly have been a part of this journey since the beginning, and now Faye and David and the Animal Planet family coming into it as well. Past five years have been crazy, guys, and I know that, you know, the Coyote Pack, as all of you are, if you're here today, um, have been just incredibly patient waiting for us to get to this moment to announce this show and to show you what we've done over the past year. And, and I'm always the first to admit in any, in any interview that, you know, people ask me, Coyote, why has the YouTube channel sort of not had as many videos, no bites and stings, no big animal presentations, and wait till you guys see what we're gonna bring out Animal Plant this year. It has taken a year to make, and it's worth the wow. wait. It's amazing. <laughs> How about you, Mario? And if you do wanna know the history of uh, Brave Wilderness, we have an extensive library on YouTube that you can start watching to get ready for the show. <laughs> it, it would probably take us five days to get through the past five years of, yeah. of what, what we've been working on, but if there is something specific you want to talk about, or I think we have questions and answers at some point, certainly feel free to ask any of the little nitty-gritty details you guys might have. We'll, for sure. We got the stories. As is custom, when we get to the end, we'll have time for some audience Q&A. We've got a microphone over there. So start thinking of your questions from now. That when we get there, you can line up, and we'll get to that portion. Uh, so let's talk, you know, so much excitement around this new series. You guys, you, you had to take the YouTube series and sort of evolve it into a long-form television series. I want to talk a little bit just about that process, what that was like. Uh, you know, was that a challenge? How did that work going into it? What was the most surprising part about that experience? Uh, you want me to start it off, or Mario, you want to kick? Why don't you kick this one off? Uh, go for it. Yeah, okay, so YouTube is a little different than network television, and the format might be a little different. Essentially, bigger adventures, bigger stories. That's what Animal Planet is bringing to the table. That's what we are bringing Animal Planet. So uh, it's changed with more equipment, uh, bigger cameras. However, you still get that intimacy that you get with what we create on YouTube, the Brave Wilderness crew. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to balance that um, small crew feel, like you're in the moment, you're uh, with us in the field, but also getting that next level, you know, like 5K style, mm -hmm. like bigger cameras. Right? 5K? I don't think we have 5K, but if you were shooting in 5K, I think that's good for everybody. I, I think the big thing that I was asked in an interview earlier was, how do you turn YouTube into television? And I said, we didn't turn YouTube into television, we turned YouTube into cinema making. And that's been the most amazing thing with our partnership with Animal Planet is when, when we conceptualized how do you go from that gritty nature you guys created on YouTube and take it to the next level, we said, well, we'll look at what they did with Planet Earth and we'll bring that into the grittiness that we create on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, we're cinema makers, right? This is beyond just a TV show. This is about creating narratives that are telling the stories of the animals that we are you know, getting close to, adventuring into their environments. And, and for us, it was very much about telling these bigger stories, and Animal Planet said, let's go for it. It's amazing. David and Faith, these guys walk in and they go, we want to take planet Earth, and we pretty much want to do that. What do you guys think when you hear that that's the bar and that's where they want to be? Like, how, do, how are we going to get to that goal? I mean, that was the first thing we discussed when I had my first conversation with Coyote was, this is YouTube meets planet Earth, yeah. and that kind of that fluctuation between that grit and the grandiosity of what planet Earth could be. Uh, the difference is we did, you know, 20 half hours in nine months of production, whereas planet Earth takes years. And so for me and for, uh, for what we were offering is uh, what Brave Wilderness offered, which is encounters with hundreds of animals. Just in the first five and a half weeks of production in Australia, we encountered 71 animals. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that's just being able to, to, to take um, such small stories like the stories of the geckos of the outback and big stories like saltwater crocs and freshwater crocs in the same season is just incredible. I mean, they've dedicated um, you know, weeks to sharks on Discovery, <laughs> and now we get to de dedicate potentially weeks and, and hours to those small little animals that mean just as much to us and to our world. That's because geckos deserve their time in the spotlight, too. <laughs> You'd be surprised how big a story you can make out of some of the smallest creatures, which yeah. is cool. Yeah, that's a very good point Devin made, is uh, we've made a, a, an effort to showcase the smaller majority of animals out there. Everyone knows what an elephant is. They're important, they're awesome, but do you know what an elephant dung beetle is? You know, like, so we try to get those bizarre creatures and make them uh, you know, into the mainstream, give them, give them that light that they deserve. 
And I think that one of the big differences between the YouTube show where you can have an episode just focused on a single animal and you don't, you know, you can make it as long or as short as you want it to be to just tell that story of that animal. When we're crafting an entire episode, you're telling much more of a story of the adventure that it takes to get there and find it, yeah. but also other animals that are in the same ecosystem as, you're, as the animal you're going toward in the end. It's a bigger, rounder story of how these animals live and interact with everything else, because along the way, Coyote meets and finds encounters a handful of other animals that have some relationship to what we're heading toward at, you know, at the end of the episode. I think it, it's a much richer environment. That's right. What's that do? How does that impact your style of investigation and how you approach the adventure? How, how does that color that, what you do now? Does that change at all because of the scale increasing so much? I mean, it's certainly a very difficult thing as a creator to go from a platform like YouTube where you don't have a time parameter, right? YouTube, I can make you a two-minute episode or I can make you a 22-minute episode. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, as long as it's entertaining, you're along for the ride. With television, we're working within blocks, right? So it's a much different world than we were used to. And the post-production process is where we're really learning some of the mathematics of, of storytelling, which is a great challenge unto its own. But when it comes to production in the field, what we do is as natural as it gets, right? We're tackling an environment and we're saying, we gotta be right place, right time to have these encounters. There's no call sheets for animals. Yeah. You're either gonna find this creature, all the conditions have to be perfect, weather, time of day, position of the moon. I mean, there's so much research that goes into finding these things naturally. And sometimes it takes days and days and days. So there is a lot of research and a lot of thought but you can never truly know what you're gonna come across, and that's what makes the episodes yeah. exciting. There's no guarantee, but let's just say we delivered on every one of our promises. Mm -hmm. So you guys will have all the content you want. It's pretty exciting. Uh, you know, having the YouTube channel that you guys have and having that established fan base, there's tons of data that comes with that, and it's very unique in that you know exactly what works, what your fans respond to, what they want to see. When you are working in a medium and with a subject that's so unpredictable, how do you sort of reconcile those two things and go, okay, where well, our fans love when this happens, but we have no control over what we're going to see and do, so how do we give them more what they want? Right, so I know and, and, the, uh, yeah. it's as simple as just getting him bit or stung by something, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. I know what the audience likes if I get bitten and stung by things. Um, and just so we're clear, there are no intentional bites and stings for Brave the Wild. It was a very important part with my message in, in teaming with Animal Planet that, look, we love the fact that bullet ants and tarantula hawks and giant centipedes got, you know, the spotlight that they did through YouTube, but there was also a stopping point for me. You know, everything that we did was well executed, well researched, and with Animal Planet, it was very much about getting to that next level of telling real animal stories and not being like, hey, look, I got stung by an ant, now you know about bullet ants. It's about <laughs> teaching about these things without having to go to those extremes. But of course, the accidental bites and those sorts of things always happen. So I think there's going to be enough of that, like, oh, 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 wow, that's exactly why I showed up within this season. I mean, you just saw that trailer, right? Yeah, got chomped in the face. So <laughs> Was that it? Was that in that? Accidental. Yes, yes. Yeah. Python I got bit in the face by a carpet python on literally like the second day of production in Australia. My so God. We were like, yeah, okay, we know where this is. Really yeah. <laughs> when you get bit in the face on day two, how do you go into day three? Like, what do you do? Like, how do you get out of bed? Well, I guess I might get bit in the well, face again. Well, you, you look at the footage that night and you say, oh man, we are off to a great start. <laughs> if this is the pace for the season, like, we're going to get good stuff. That's for sure. That's when the showrunner is, is nodding his head and. Yep. Writing some good notes, I yeah, think. That's right. exactly right. That's when I knew we had a show. Well, that shot's going to go in trailers for sure. <laughs> 120 yeah. frames per second, I think, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> shot on red. 5K. 5K. 6K Five, for the bite of the face. 6K. All the Ks. I, uh, I want to talk about, walk us through, all right, so walk us through, like, uh, the making of an episode. How, where does it start? Where does it begin? Do you choose, is there, like, a bucket list of locations you haven't been yet? or does the wildlife you want to see sort of dictate where you're going to go? How does that start? So we have this chair in our office, one of these swivel chairs, but it doesn't have any arms, so you're like, you can get it going real fast like the <laughs> Tilt-A-Whirl. And I put Mario in it, I put a blindfold on him, and I give him a handful of like these four-sided darts. So you just throw them at the wall and they'll stick. <laughs> I'm making all that That's up. A throwing no, there's a, a lot of research that goes into every location, yeah, and yeah. the big thing that people don't realize is, is seasonality is everything when it comes to locating animals in the wild. Mm -hmm. it, it's actually like a dream list for Coyote and I and the crew. We yeah. are passionate about these animals and, and their childhood dreams to go out and encounter them. So it's easy to, to 
put you know, some species on paper and then look at the seasonality and get excited. And uh, it's about, yeah, that bucket list, that, that yeah. species list that we have and uh, going out and, and, and encountering them. So yeah. that's the easy part, to be honest. Really? Uh, yeah. It is finding, it, it's, the hard part is finding the seasonality, the logistics of that, but there will always be animals out there, countless species that interest us and will definitely interest you guys. Yeah. yeah, I would also add that there's a lot of story production that goes into the pre-production. Um, I mean, Brave Wilderness has been on, uh, on YouTube for five years, and um, Coyote Mario and Mark have done a really good job of uh, sustaining a network of conservationists and wildlife biologists and people around the world that they can pull from. Mm -hmm. There's just a, an amazing array of, of other heroes out there that are able to help them bring, bring them into these spaces. So we've done a lot of work in regard to making sure that those stories are beat out and prepared for for those happy accidents and encounters to happen. Yeah, yeah. What does your research process look like? You talk about how much there's extensive research that goes into it. I imagine you guys have access to resources beyond, like obviously we all start with you know, Wikipedia and Google, but like you must have, uh, especially with the relationships that you've built, like where do you turn when you have questions that are impossible to answer? Um, I mean, I always turn to Mario, <laughs> and <laughs> Mario usually Mario's has a pretty good answer. <laughs> Mario. No, I mean, we do, we do a lot of research, and, and one thing that I mentioned in an interview earlier is that, like, yeah, we certainly use the internet, but the thing about the internet is there is so much information, you never know what's right and what's not yeah. right. We rely really heavily, actually, on older field guides and, really? and wildlife journals and yeah. papers that have been written huh. that are stuff that's, like, buried. Like, we'll order books on, like, Amazon and stuff like that or go to old bookstores and find, like, animal books from, like, the 70s and 80s because, and even older, because you have to realize that for people to write those books at that, that point in time, they had to go out and, and analyze these animals in, in the wild. So it wasn't just somebody being like, today I'm going to write about grizzly bears and research a bunch of websites. Right. Like they were out there actually observing these animals in the wild. So we rely heavily on, on researchers of the past. Right, it, it's, it's an investigation. It's yeah. actually one of the, the funnest as aspects that we do. And it's this research that we get into, and it'll lead to us contacting a biologist. There's, there's always a specialist out there that is specializing in a specific species. You name the species, someone is an expert on that species, right? So we need to find that person. And we often do. We contact them, and the research goes from there. So it's, it's a really fun investigation of, you know, my favorite part is ordering all the books and stuff. And, uh, reading through because it's easy to get that information online, but sometimes you know the sources may not be credible. So we always have to make sure that sources are correct. Uh, but it, it's just a fun process, and it could be fairly quick. And we find that expert, and they're like, "Yep, come on over. Let's let's film this animal." Or it could take weeks. Uh, we've had productions that have taken up to a year because we're finding that perfect spot, that perfect location, perfect uh, you know expert that's going to help us out. Do you have like a favorite or like go-to like awesome old book spot or person? Like do you have a resource for that? I'm just really fascinated with the mental image of you in like a dusty old bookstore, like in full coyote regalia. It's magical. That's a good question. And the honest answer is antique malls. Like we'll, we'll scour an, antique malls to find like old vintage animal books from like, I have some stuff that dates back to like the 1800s and stuff like that. Really? Because you can find cool words and phrases and I ideas and descriptions that old researchers have used and it's ways that we don't talk today and obviously I don't use that same you know language right, right. per se but it does give you a different slant on how to approach presenting an animal we also go to the local like elementary school and use their library so imagine Coyote and I like in a library and you know do that like time warp thing we're just going through the books and looking that is through totally and made up <laughs> <laughs> it'd be cool to show that though all right I know this is a mean thing to do, but if I put you on the spot, can you give me a cool 1800s special word that we might not use all the time? Um, oh, wow, that is a good on the spot. I can come um, back. It's, it's not so much like a single word as much as it is a, like a phrasing of sentences yeah. or a way that an environment will be described. Um, I don't want to necessarily say like in a more poetic way, but when people were writing books a long time ago, not that people don't write books and get real descriptive of things today, but like the description that they had to use to paint the picture of an environment or an animal. Um, I was actually reading, remember that book we, we found this summer at that one Airbnb we were staying at? Yeah. That was uh, actually written by Teddy Roosevelt on his escapades, which, you know, he was a hunter originally. And, and back in the day when 
he was collecting specimens. A lot of it was for research, but people shot animals, put them in museums. And some of his descriptions about mountain lions and calling it like the desert cat, it's like, who calls a mountain lion a desert cat yeah. these days? It, you know, weird things like that that I find to be really interesting that yeah. even when we go out and produce an episode, those sort of things run through the back of my mind because I try to put myself in that position of an old explorer, right? Yeah. We're doing the exact same things these people were doing back in the day, but we're not hunting with guns, we're hunting with cameras. Sure. Looking for that encounter that gets us into that ultimate moment of encounter. For sure. Ye old desert cat. That's the old awesome. desert cat. Prowled <laughs> off the mountainside and I could hear it from a mile away. You know? <laughs> let's go. Uh, let's go to the other side of the spectrum. Since we're talking about old timey stuff, we joked about uh, the, the amount of K, the five K, six K, all the. Yeah. yeah. But th the truth is, you guys use a lot of innovative gadgets. You have a lot of really cool technology that you use to capture all these adventures. If you had to pick one, which is your favorite gadget to work with, and why? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, one of the big things about this show, again, is is how do you mix that grittiness of YouTube? to make you feel like you're submersed in the environment. Right. As compared to like, oh cool, it's a dude with a shoulder camera. Oh, what are you doing down there, coyote? You know, and you don't really get those cameras where they need to be to give you the animal perspective. Um, the main camera that we use on the show is something called a Canon 705, which is pretty small. What's that camera right there? What are you shooting on? You, Similar main camera. Camcorder style, that's a Sony. What is it? JVC. JVC. So the 705 is just a touch big, bigger than that. Mm -hmm. um, GoPros honestly get some of the coolest shots still. Um, we use simple drones. ROV. Yeah, it's the in ROV. Terms of ROV. Yeah. That was everyone's favorite. So yeah. we did what we well, we had like an hour long argument about what we were going to call it in the show, but it's like an underwater drone. Yeah. Well, it's like a submarine fun. drone, yeah, pretty submarine much. Yeah, submarine drone. And it's um, it was pretty amazing because it can get quite close to these animals under the water, and the animals didn't seem to care. Like they. They were completely nonplussed by it, so we were able to get so close to them, light shining right on them. Mm -hmm. It was actually really cute, too, to watch it swimming wow. around. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think that was a lot of people's favorite. Is that one of the doors that you would say is open because of the partnership with Animal Planet, that you get to try out some new gear and use some crazy things? I'd say it's... Is Faye writing those checks? The, the, <laughs> no, the, the, gear, <laughs> the gear isn't tied to that relationship necessarily at all, because... To be honest with you, I mean, we're, we're not shooting on 35 millimeter cameras. Like, all gear is extremely affordable mm -hmm. these days. It's about getting the right production time to tell and craft yeah. the mm -hmm. right story. Right. With YouTube, for example, I mean, we might visit a location and only have a week to stay there and have to shoot seven or eight episodes. With this series, we have the amazing luxury that is time. Right? Time yeah. is the most important thing when it comes to crafting a story because when you're telling a longer story, it's the, the, the search for the animals is obviously your nucleus, right? right? Unless you have that encounter, you don't have the episode. So we will work and work and work to get that encounter on camera. And once we do, we look at the story pieces that were filmed naturally, and then we say, how do you go back and get the frosting? How do you get the sprinkles? How do you get the cherry on top? And that comes with intervalometer shots, epic drone shots at the right time of day with the perfect light, the perfect clouds. I mean, we pay attention to all of these things. And those are the elements where, with YouTube, we'd be like, quick, somebody get a B-roll shot of yep. feet with a GoPro. And now it's like we take the time to set those moments, focus pulls, all these cinema terms that might be really boring to everybody, but that is the level that we're trying to bring this yeah. show to differentiate it from YouTube. That's right, and I, I mean, I'd also add, in, in regard to some of these cameras, you know, um, non-invasive filmmaking is a huge part of this, this endeavor, is sometimes when you have a crew of, you know, with a footprint of nine, the animals obviously respond very differently. And with the underwater ROVs or, um, or our drones, like we can see animals in their natural habitat. We can see different behaviors that just we've never been able to see before. So specifically with that underwater drone, we actually got to see some amazing behavior that's never been documented before in certain species. Right, and uh, camera traps too. Yeah, uh, that's right. Nowadays, uh, camera traps are becoming very affordable and um, the technology is getting so good that you've got these little devices that you could set up somewhere like, uh, for example, in the Pantanal and maybe get a glimpse of one of the big cats there, which we kind of did. I don't know that they know what the Pantanal is, so you should oh, explain. Right. Uh, <laughs> this location in Brazil. <laughs> it's not uh, just down the street here in New York. <laughs> look it up, guys, in the library. Pantanal Go to the street, library. Yes. Pantanal. Anyways, Pantanal. Anyways, camera traps are fantastic, because you could set them up, and they're very minimum invasiveness, like the animals are not going to even know they're there. They pass by, you get some great footage. Uh, and we're implementing camera traps a lot, and they've been very successful uh, recently when we were in Brazil. 
We were talking a little bit uh, earlier just about attention to detail and hearing you speak about all the different pieces of equipment and all the, the gear that you use. I'm, I'm curious, as the show's grown and as it's scaled up, have you guys had to learn to sort of step away and let other people take over certain parts of the job that you'd been doing since the beginning? And like, was that hard to do? That's a great question. And it's not about taking away parts of the job. It's bringing new people in to help with the jobs because we wore so many hats, right? It, like it's so much fun to be able to show up on location and be able to focus on telling the story and focus on searching for the the animals and not having to worry about some of the more mundane things that people don't realize in the grand scheme of production because i don't care if you're shooting survivor man or man versus wild or brave the wild or whatever it is you still have to eat you still have to sleep you still have to transport from one spot to another all those logistical and mathematical elements that are involved behind the scenes to make any production fall into any show that is made. So for us, bringing in people like David in the field to do the show running, he's like the chess master, right? So if yeah. you picture a chess board as being a TV show, David lines up those pieces to make sure that Mario and Mark and I can go out and execute our roles as best we can. This guy's still running camera. I'm still getting shots. Mark's still getting shots. Um, we essentially, as Wilderness Productions, teamed up with Animal Planet to build this to the next level. A lot of people, when they heard, oh, Coyote's partnering with Animal Planet, oh, you sold out finally, we knew everybody eventually. There is absolutely zero selling out with any of what this relationship is. It's about creating the perfect team to make the best animal show that's ever been produced. And we are yeah. all on the same page with that. And that's what's so special about this relationship is Animal Planet giving us as creatives the ability to run and follow our imaginations and our desires to, yeah. to track down these species. All right, it kind of makes our jobs a little easier in a sense by having this crew and these experts as well that, you know, essentially we're allowed to do what we're gonna do and, and you know, someone's making sure that the other shots are getting, you know, done and, and all these pieces are being put together. So it makes our job a lot easier actually. Awesome. Every, every episode, because people look at television, I think oftentimes compartmentalize it into like, oh, TV is not a movie, TV is not YouTube. No, it's not, but the thing that I think we try to always remind people, and, and we, we do a little bit on YouTube, and I think we're trying to do even more with the television series, is that like, this is our backgrounds in production, mm -hmm. right? It, we're very much into animals and the adventure and all that, but it's also about storytelling. Right. And because we're having the chance to now tell these stories about all these different animals within a season, each episode is its own unique mini movie and no two episodes are alike. And that's why we think a television series like this, it, obviously we know it's gonna capture you guys as an audience because of the Coyote Pack, but it's, it's also about bringing in more people that are not familiar with the Brave Wilderness Channel and that are huge fans of Animal Planet that are thirsting for deep animal stories, unique animal stories. That's absolutely right. I mean, the thing that, um Whenever I, I, I'm brought onto a show uh, as showrunner, you know, my first goal on a first season is to help build that show and to empower what could be working about it through its development and to just take away the auction of what shouldn't work. Yeah. And, um, you know, um, Coyote, Mario, and Mark, and the whole Brave Wilderness team are incredible producers already. I mean, five years of success and development through YouTube. You're not going to pour that on me, are you? No, I'm going to get this <laughs> okay. one. Clearly, I drink more than that. <laughs> Entering uh, the wet zone. <laughs> yeah, to, and, and so, um, so, it, the, so having the stability and to create more or less this, this silver platter for Coyote and Mario to succeed in the field was absolutely necessary to get the show done, to allow them the time to sit and look at trail cams, to set up these cameras and, and, and lay it all out, and also to afford them the opportunity to really do what they want to do. I mean, on my first show, I was, um, it was one that I created, and I was so scared. And I was terrified, and I was overworked, and it was 18 hours of oh every day for like a year and a half of just going. And I just, I love the opportunity to be able to help kind of help this team through that process so that it's not as nerve-wracking as it was for me. I heard you say the phrase, do what we want to do, so I'm real curious as to when I asked about flying a helicopter and jumping out of its catchy unicorn, and I was told no, why that phrase wasn't used at that point in time. I think that I, think that I said no. Yeah. You I mean, said no. I mean, but okay. it's, okay. That may not have been in the budget. And it's but. also the painstaking seasonality of unicorn season. <laughs> that's is, hard to is, I mean, we got Bigfoot on trail camera, but that, you know, that's for another. 
I'm not giving anything away. They've seen the picture. They, they already had a Bigfoot show. Real quick, uh, I just want to commend you for this, this level. This is what I mean by attention to detail. The man turned the water sideways because he was aware of how noisy the ice was and quietly poured himself another <laughs> beverage. It's a small detail. I mean, listen to this. He knew about it. Listen. We've got our sound engineer the out there. We're doing that. Yeah, exactly. we're doing the how was right. that, Beetle? I, I, Pretty good? <laughs> I want to, we've talked so much about making the show and about all the gear behind it and about all the stories. I want to talk specifically about the Australia trip uh, in the Devil's Ark. Went out there uh, to kind of talk about their work and, and find out what they were doing, and then you ended up in a feeding frenzy, uh, and it looks like an insane time. Before we jump in, I want to give the room some context. We actually have a clip of this moment, so we're going to take a look at that real quick first. This is the ultimate encounter I have been waiting for. But nothing can truly prepare you for entering a Tasmanian devil feeding frenzy. I have gone through all the training to become an intern here today at the Devil Ark, and my big reward is entering an enclosure with a bunch of very hungry devils. And as you can hear, the hunger cries have begun. All right, so Max, we have about 30 pounds worth of kangaroo right there. But what's going to happen when I go through the gate? Look, as soon as you go through the gate, have this out first. Anytime a devil approaches you, you need to put the food in their face so they bite onto that and not your legs. I'll watch your back, but if they do come around your back, just swing it around and make sure that that is the first piece of thing that they can possibly bite. Okay. And what happens if one grabs onto my arm? Well, don't let them do that. I'm a little nervous. Um, here we go. This is going to be intense. Okay. Ready? One. Two. Dinner served, boys and girls. Come on behind me, come on behind me. Whoa! Oh, watch my legs. Getting too close, too close. Look at that power. Total Tasmanian devil feeding frenzy. And I am right in the middle of it. Ah, quite a stark difference between the cuteness we saw earlier and this aggression towards having a meal. Oh, don't you bite my foot, don't you bite my foot. Okay, let's get up on the stake. Here we go. Oh, watch my fingers. Ah, woo. Tasmanian devils feasting. Look at the carnage. This is unprecedented. I've never seen anything like this. Bones, tendons, skin, fur, everything is consumed by these animals. Wow. Who's hungry now? Cheeseburgers? My favorite part of that is, is while they're all going crazy, you're still like two feet away, crouched <laughs> down, face level. Like, look at how amazing this is. They're, they're pretty intimidating little beasties, though. Super it's intimidating. Incredible. Tell me a little bit about that trip real quick. It looks like it was wild. It, it really was, and, and working with the Tasmanian Devils was something we've wanted to do for a long time. I mean, we're all familiar of the plight of the Tasmanian tiger that was wiped off the planet. It was, it was the largest carnivorous marsupial within human times. Um, and the Tazi Devils are unfortunately now stricken with something that has nothing to do with humans. Uh, it's something called the Devil Facial Tumor Disease. Um, and it's unfortunately wiping a lot of these devils off their native island of Tasmania. So um, the Devil Ark, which is now known as the Aussie Ark, uh, they basically grabbed what's called an insurance population, and they are now breeding healthy devils to make sure that they, they won't go extinct. It's a very unique project, and it's, it's, again, perfectly positioned in an area that is ideal for these animals. It's, it may not be Tasmania, but the altitude and the environment, all that is perfectly designed for these animals to survive. And mm. I mean, it's a tireless effort that these guys go through every single day to make sure the species is going to be preserved. So. That's amazing. When, uh, when you ask an important question, like, what do I do if it bites my arm? And the advice is, well, don't let that happen. <laughs> uh, how do you, as someone who tries to plan for every precaution, like, what do you do after that? Do you just, go, I guess I can't let him bite my arm. Like, you have to know in the back of your mind it's possible. Oh, well, yeah, it's, it's definitely possible. And the thing that a lot of people don't realize about Tasmanian devils is that even though they're small, I mean, they're marsupial, but they seem like they're mixed between a wolverine and a groundhog and just like somebody having a really bad day. Um, <laughs> once they get into that feeding frenzy mode, they're really only worried about getting that meat. So an accidental bite was possible, 
but the, it's the jaw pressure that you have to worry about. I mean, a single bite from a Tasmanian devil, that grabs your calf muscle, like forget about it, because the second they have something, they're gonna like, Wah! and just like <laughs> rip you apart. But mm -hmm. you don't really think about it when you're in the moment. You're like, man, this is an awesome experience. Like how many people have been yeah. inside the feeding frenzy with Tasmanian devil? To our knowledge, we're actually the first people to ever film really? what this sort of a, an encounter was. So. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, and you know that going in, and I guess that's what draws you out there, is to be the first to do something like that. And Absolutely. bring that to us, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the whole episode is about the conservation for the species, and the Aussie Ark, or Devil Ark as it was formerly known, is the only place in the world, and they are the only people saving this animal. So when I say we're the only ones to have filmed this, I know that's the case, because Max is the guy that runs the place. He's like, no one's ever come here and done this before. So yeah. that's a pretty cool <laughs> opportunity. Yeah, really significant, that population. I mean, 90% of the species in their original uh, habitat in Tasmania disappeared because mm -hmm. of the disease. So that's, that's the future of that species, and it's quite amazing to have that encounter. Uh, and visually, and, and not just visually, but the, the sound that they made, that's what resonated with all of us. It's just this like guttural sound, amazing. And the reason why they're actually not necessarily attacking us is because they're actually primarily scavengers. Hmm. So they go after carcasses and stuff like that. So they don't really hunt, which is good news for us, and that's why we're able to get inside close to them. Yeah. But yeah. here, oh, real quick, I just want to say, here's what's so important about an episode like that. While we love watching a clip and you see like, holy cow, this is crazy, you got him with these snarling creatures. It's an episode like that that varies from an episode that's like going out to catch a snapping turtle to show you this prehistoric looking creature. It's an episode like that that can grab the imagination of a younger audience member or audiences our age that you say, wow, I knew nothing about this animal, now I want to get involved and make a difference. Or I want to now put my focus into wildlife biology and end up being somebody that works here at the Aussie Ark to help take care of these animals. So it's a, it's, it's a moment like that and a story like that that we hope to reach an audience and inspire them to get involved with these conservation yeah. efforts. Uh, for sure. I mean, that moment, it's hard not to connect with what's happening in mm -hmm. that video. Uh, so Australia, that's one of like the, the tons of places that you guys went. You've been filming uh, episodes that will premiere in early 2020. Can you give us uh, a preview of other places that you went? Sure. Yeah. I mean, so how about we'll say our favorite, our favorite places and then maybe a quick story off of what that was. And we'll start with you and go that way and then I'll end it. Because okay. I want to see what you guys pick so that I can pick the, the favorite best place one. to shoot. Your favorite place, place to shoot an go. animal or like moment in like a 30 second ramble. Um, I have to stick with Australia because I got to cuddle a wombat for, I don't know, like an hour or two. <laughs> <laughs> That's nothing else compares to that. Cuddling a wombat <laughs> is pretty legit. I had when a you special, guys special see, moment. See Gracie, yeah, she's yeah. pretty cute. Um, that was the marsupials, that whole, all of Australia was wonderful, but um, the marsupials was really special because yeah. it was my dream. I put up with a lot of deadly spiders and deadly snakes. <laughs> See, we're making dreams come true. <laughs> this is experiences. What it's all about. I didn't care about anything else. <laughs> David, what about you, ma'am? Um, I'm going to mix it up just because I do agree that the marsupials were pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. um, we just got back last week from Arizona and mm -hmm. spent um, three days with an incredible bee guy. I'm named Chris Brinton. How many of you guys have seen Bee Beard Gone Wrong on YouTube? Oh man, you all have homework after this then. Okay. It, it, but it was working with him and seeing Coyote. Um, well, he can give you the, the hot tip on exactly how incredible that was. I'm not going to spoil it, but it was absolutely incredible to see the work that he's doing in, in the Southwest with bees and seeing kind of the evolution of their value from being killer bees, which, you know, were a pest, to now being more or less the saviors of uh, great, greater ecology in the world. So to see Africanized bees now, you know, hybridizing with Europeanized bees um, and basically helping to sustain ecosystems worldwide is pretty amazing. It's a, a really great hope spot within the season. And I'll give a quick spoiler on that episode. So because almost all of you said I've never seen Bee Beard go, gone wrong, now you have to all go to YouTube later and watch Bee Beard gone wrong. Because when I worked with Chris the first time, I wore a Bee Beard or attempted to do it and was stung 60 times in the face. That's how oh, behavior yeah. goes wrong. Plastic surgery. This time, Chris time. said, let's up the ante and let's do it again. And we did. And we wore, I wore 13,000 bees on my face. God. It yeah. is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. Somebody started to do a blood for 13,000 bees, and, I think. And, and, and for 13, context. 13,000, buddy. Yeah. Let's yeah. get it. When, when you see it, it's, it's pretty insane. And for context, 
1,000 bees equals one pound of yeah. weight. So that's 13 pounds of bees on his face. Yeah. When you gotta start measuring your bees in pounds, I think you're, you're doing too many bees. That's a lot of bees. <laughs> a lot of bees. All right, Mario, location and animal. Um, well, I love reptiles and amphibians. Uh, it tends to be my specialty, but I will say uh, Brazil and our encounter with a jaguar was very mm. special. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Aaron Coyote, do you want to? No, man, he's that is really not here? giving any sneak peeks on oh, that. Oh, no, no, I'm not going to give. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Um, I, have a, I have a lot of favorites from this season, uh, and we shot Australia, South America, and the United States primarily. Um, but you guys all know, or most of you probably know, I love snapping turtles. So the series <laughs> is set to premiere with the biggest turtle tale we've ever told. Um, you know, we give a little bit of the backstory of who I am and how this started, which certainly was my love for the common snapping turtle in central Ohio. Uh, and really, we have, we've ridden the like, obscureness of the common snapping turtle to what this has all become today. Um, and we, within the course of this past summer, ended up catching the largest alligator snapping turtle that I have ever seen. So the episode starts with my background in common snapping turtles, and then we go after this legendary turtle that's never been caught in Texas. Um, and I'll just give it away. We no, caught no, it. No, no, yeah, no, 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 no. This is special. This is a special room. It's, it's, yeah, these don't, guys don't get you guys special have insider to, like, information. Protect that? Or? Well, it's, you know what? If you <laughs> Trust get, me. I've got something we can give away. If you no, I can give this away because you guys are going to want to see how insane this episode is. And it's, you said that's the first episode? Is that the premiere? Yeah. It's slated as oh, now, right. but depending on how it goes through post-production, it will be what? very early on for sure. And that's oh, yeah. when you get to see that underwater drone in action, yeah. too, yeah. so it's really special. Yeah, it, dude, this, these, this alligator snapping turtle is, you will never believe that a dinosaur of this size existed. It's in crazy. Texas. In I've, Texas. I've got a, I happen to have here, if you guys want to know it, I've got the date the show's going to premiere. Do you guys want to know when the show premieres? <laughs> Should I, should I tell him? Yeah, you can tell him. All right. Well, uh, here we go. The official premiere date for the all-new Animal Planet series, Coyote Peterson, Brave the Wild, is February 9th, 2020. Mark your calendars. That is when it hits the air. Yes. But here's, here's what's cool. So that's officially when the series launches, but I believe we're doing a sneak peek of it on February 2nd, Ooh. which will be Puppy Bowl Sunday. There's that's Super Bowl right. Sunday, then there's Puppy Bowl Sunday. Puppy Bowl, Puppy but Bowl here's fans. what's great is yeah. that that's also Groundhog's Day. So if you Big watch day. the episode that night, it just keeps repeating <laughs> your day over and over, and then you just get to Unless watch that episode back. continuously. It's like the best thing that can happen. Um, Cool, I wanna make sure we have time for the audience Q&A, but there's also another really cool thing. We're super excited, we have to reveal here an exclusive first look at the series to everybody today. This is the first time this clip is being showed anywhere. You are the first people to see it. Uh, and I was gonna play that too, but again, are, do you guys wanna see that? I don't know, I wanna make sure that, that's what I thought. I thought that. I was pretty sure, but I just wanted to make sure. So let's go ahead and take a look at that clip really quick. One more clip. with an animal to share it with all of you. You never know what you're gonna come across. Oh, this is one of the ones that has the crazy Spider-Man fluid. Look at that. There's always something to keep you on your toes. Oh, got it, yes, the woman guy. The stonefish. This is exactly what it would wanna do with its prey. Look at that face. Oh. I'm gonna do something rather crazy right now. Woo. It is the most bizarre looking gecko I have ever seen. Ah. Snake of the size can definitely open you up. Oh. You're right, man. Ah. Wow. 
And just for the record, that alligator snapping turtle is not the one that we were talking about. That That's was not the, the one? That was the smallest no. one we caught on that trip. Yes. That's wild. 5K All right, footage. So Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was gonna say, we're gonna do the audience Q&A. If you have any questions, now's the time. Head over to the microphone, queue up. While you guys are getting in place, I'll ask one last question. Uh, was there a moment on the show where you questioned, not your safety, but just like, what are we doing here? I, I, like, there's so many insane moments in that video alone. Going through your head, Cody, was there ever a time where you were like, maybe we've gone too far? Uh, I don't think so. No. I mean, we, we do so much preparation for these shoots and take so much care and precision when it comes to making sure the situation is safe for myself, the crew, most importantly always, the animals. Um, that, you know, any one of these scenarios where you interact with an animal has the potential to be dangerous, but it's all about making sure you're prepared and, and staying focused and having a good team behind you to, to make sure that happens. That's awesome. I think, I think it's always a really important thing to highlight is the amount of preparation you guys put in so you can go be in those scenarios. It's just amazing the amount of work it takes to do that. Congratulations. We've got a ton of people. This is awesome. All right, let's go for the first question. The mic is yours. Hello. Uh, my name is Patrick. Uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, that was a pretty insane uh, clip right there. Uh, <laughs> my question is, uh, as someone that is interested in filmmaking, and uh, one of those things is the equipment uh, used for it, was there ever a point within any uh, episode or any point in the production where your, your equipment was like in danger or like like anything for the animals with the equipment or anything like that, just almost damaging everything or That's putting the production in, je uh, in jeopardy? That's a good, that? good question. Mario, I'll let you answer that because you're yeah. usually more hands-on cameras than I am. I'll definitely answer that because uh, there was an incident in Australia where we had a GoPro and we had yeah. some amazing footage on this GoPro that we've been collecting throughout the day. And then Coyote got a, a crocodile to basically bite it off and <laughs> make it disappear into the river. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not just a crocodile, a giant saltwater yeah. crocodile. <laughs> That's right, yeah. So uh, we often push the limits, this guy, uh, <laughs> putting cameras a little too close to stuff. And uh, sometimes we have some casualties. But other times, many times, we, we get in the face. You know, we want that in the face encounter with the, with the animal. And um, sometimes we have to sacrifice the camera for that, and that's OK. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's a, a really. Good example where Coyote got a camera. You didn't. But, uh, but I'll counter that mistake in saying that it was actually the only camera we lost all season. Just so you know. It's true. true. It's true. Which we is lost, true. We lost a couple walkies. A walk uh, David yeah. kept dropping his walkie to be yeah. specific. Yeah, but the walkie talkie's not actually <laughs> into water. The show. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the, I guess the worst part of that camera incident is if you do have an incident where a camera gets destroyed, you didn't. You want it to be filmed as well, yeah. right? Because then it's like, oh yeah, that's kind of cool. Now, no one filmed this encounter. <laughs> yeah, oh. it was it was kind of a very ominous moment. But we do take in incredible care with our gear, and I, I do note that we only lost one GoPro because we put cameras into some pretty insane situations, um, and we we analyzed that situation. There was a scene we shot in Brazil um, where I went into the den of an anaconda, which is one of the most crazy scenes I think we captured this entire. I mean, who goes? Inside, like if you when you see what I went through to get into this anaconda's home, it's like Cribs edition is the anaconda here, and I'm like neck deep in mud, and like we were like, well, we can't put you know the 705s in there, so I had to use a GoPro and film it very gritty Blair Witch Project style, and you really feel as if you were in that snake's home with me. And the thing is, we don't know if the snake is home or not, so you gotta kind of stay tuned for that scene. Yeah, but it's, it's good, amazing. Thank you for your question. Next Thank one, you. go for it. Hey, how the hey? Loud. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was great, buddy. <laughs> so uh, you rose through the ranks from like uh, as like small YouTuber to like you know the creme de la creme as uh, as like. Could <laughs> Thank you. That's it. a nice comment. But like, how did it feel to like you know get on the trending pages to like you know climb through and what was your feeling like when you finally got approved at the show and like. No, now you get to live like the show. That's a good. That's yeah, a really good question. good question. I mean, the 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 wave. I call it the wave that we caught on YouTube. You know, and there's YouTube is a 
an amazing platform for people to share their stories. I'm, I'm always promoting for people to, if you've got a camera or you're interested in making content, like you can do it and you can distribute it now through something like YouTube. Um, and we happen to be in the right place at the right time to catch the wave that we caught to really get people excited about animals. Um, and again, I mean, I know that our bite and sting content is what created that massive swell. But we also recognized that like that very small percentage of content also brought people in to find episodes about like manatee conservation or hellbender conservation and, and some of these bigger animal stories. So with then getting to transition that to Animal Planet, um, I guess it just made a, a lot of sense for us to, to get to that next story level. And we couldn't have done it without YouTube, but it really comes from the audience, and, and not to like sound cliche, but without the Coyote Pack, without all those people that are watching on YouTube, we would not have found ourselves in the position to create this vision with Animal Planet. Thank awesome. you. Great question. Thanks, man. Next one. Uh, in the TV show, uh, at the end of every episode, is there going to be like a conservational message, like how, uh, what we can do to uh, help protect these, um, these types of wildlife and areas? I'll, I'll let you stab at that one. Yeah, we, we always want to try to uh, have a conservation message involved in, in any of the segments that we're producing now, more so with the Animal Planet segments. Uh, let's use the Tasmanian Devil segment for an example. You, there's going to be a, a link that you could follow, like or uh, I guess you can't follow it on TV anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> you see the YouTube. Anyways, there'll be information as to what you can do to actually, you know, go and help the Tasmanian Devils by donating or, or, or going to the website, for example. Uh, so we'll, we'll try to have that conservation message, not just on, for example, the segments, but in our social medias, mm -hmm. um, which we're very active on, and that's usually where we could steer the audience to, like, go help this organization or uh, such. Another, you know, at the end of the day, what it really breaks down to is there's not enough conservation done on the grand plethora of species, right? So a gecko's episode that we produced, there's no conservation project out there for the knob-tailed gecko, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not to say that somebody that watches that episode isn't like, you know what? My life's goal is to protect these little lizards that people don't pay a lot of attention to. Sure. And that's where our job is most important, to get people excited about these species that maybe they didn't even know existed. That's yeah. right. Yeah, I think, I think that's ultimately the biggest uh, goal is to just get these animals uh, into the mainstream, into the light, and to inspire you guys to maybe become a biologist or a conservationist. Yeah. Thank Great you question. very much. Thanks, Great question. Man. Great question. Next up. Hi. Um, you spoke about being inspired by 19th century field guides mm -hmm. for your research. And during that time, there are different moral paradigms that were going on. Um, I was wondering what challenges today, um, what viewpoints today you're hoping to kind of break or change in terms of conservation through Brave the Wild. Hmm, that's a good question. David, do you want to start <laughs> off answering that? Um, I, 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 I have to confess, um, I've made, but before coming onto the show, I'd, I'd made 34 hours of the Animal Planet, and only six of those hours are on animals. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, and so this was a great honor to bring to the fore so many new species. This is, again, this is not just sharks, this is not just lions and elephants. Getting down into the grain into all of the species that um, we're focusing on is, is hugely valuable. So that's the evolution. I mean, when I, when I f uh, first got a call from, from Aaron and Coyote in regard to coming on the show, literally that day an article came out in the New York Times that said that we've eradicated 50% of all wildlife species in the wild in the last 25 years. And I realized that there was a part of me that needed to, to be a part of this and to right. bring those stories to the largest audience as physically possible so that we can create those catalyzing moments when someone falls in love with an obtail gecko and just throws their entire life into it. We need to do that with every single species in the wild. Right. So that's the difference. So when, you know, even Darwin or, you know, Teddy Roosevelt was bringing dead species to the Explorers Club and saying, look at these amazing things, we don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. We, can, we can do that through this show. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference, is that those animals can live unmolested out in the wild and we can put a GoPro on them and literally change um, their path of existence. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. Great question, thank you. Mario Coyote, I was just wondering, what's some of your favorite fan-made content to interact with you or the community, or to ju just for you and the community? 
fan made comic yeah. content yeah. um as in like videos or like artwork or anything like that anything anything i mean I, we get so much amazing fan mail which we celebrate and we have a, a base camp in our office that we will swap out things that are hanging on the wall but i honestly find incredible amusement when people make their own coyote peterson spoof videos i have seen some <laughs> yeah. pretty incredible yeah, ones out there mm -hmm. uh even people that will like research down to like the shots oh, and yeah. the framing um, so people think that I probably don't watch those things, but we'll have days in the office where we'll just yeah. do searches if we've got like a little bit of downtime. We're like, let's see if anybody's made some new <laughs> new videos. So, yeah, it's it's just cool that we've been able to inspire people to um, whether it's making animal content on their own that is serious or if, that it's something that is a spoof. Like, yeah. it's very flattering. That's for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find some of the fan art oh, that yeah. people uh, tag us on. I think the fan art is amazing for sure. Um, and as Katie said, we have a base camp set where we get tons of mail in and we will decorate kind of the entire base camp with uh, the fan art and that's there's awesome. some very talented fans out there, that's for sure. Yeah. Very cool. Thanks Thank you. Great question, man. Yeah. Hi. Um, so earlier you talked a lot about like the seasonality of the different animals that you're looking for and how important that is to actually be able to find and film them and that you had like lists of animals that you were interested in looking for. How often is it that like you guys spend all this time looking for this animal and filming and then you just don't find it and has being on Animal Planet had given you more time to like look into it and like try again than the YouTube channel would have? Um, I would definitely say that, you know, the production schedule with Animal Planet, yes, gives us more time in theory, but it's still the same amount of effort regardless day in and day out. You only have so many hours of daylight or so many hours of nighttime, depending on when an animal is going to be active, that um, we were just incredibly fortunate this season to have honestly pretty much found everything that we were searching for. Okay. I mean, it, I yeah. could, we could not have done better than, than what we did. To be but it, it, it came at a, at a yeah, huge so challenge. Um, a, an example of we could be as prepared as we think we are, and, and you know, you book these trips months in advance. And uh, for example, we were timing our trip to Australia for the end of the rainy season in the Northern Territory. Um, and at the end of the rainy season means everything's going to be lush and vegetation and animals are going to be moving around. Well, when we got there, the rainy season didn't come. So <laughs> we were in this extended drought that made searching for one of our target species very difficult. Uh, so no matter how prepared you are, sometimes, you know, nature will throw a curveball at you. And yeah. um, usually we, we uh, persevere and um, it's about being opportunistic and then, you know, seeing what the environment's going to give you back. Awesome. Okay. Great question. Thank, Thank you. you. We've got time for just a few more. See if we can get you three in. Go for it. Hey, how you doing? Um, so I know that you knew what you were getting into when you started researching the Schmidt Pain Index, going through all the biting and stinging insects. What's the uh, worst thing that's happened outside of that? Unexpected bites and stings while filming. As in on this season of Brave the Wild? Or anything that didn't make you know, the takes just, for YouTube. Just in general? Yeah. I mean, one of the worst bites I received all season accidentally came from a piranha, which for years people have been asking me to get bitten by a piranha. Um, and unfortunately, it was also a moment that we weren't filming because we just filmed a little segment on piranha. We were swimming with uh, Jacare Cayman. We wanted to see what else was in the environment, and it's swarming with piranha. So this is great, right? Like, let's get in the water with all these piranha. And um, we did this, like, little mini kind of, like, fishing scene where, like, you can just catch them with a piece of meat and a string off the side of a boat. And we let the piranha go, and then Mario and I looked at each other. We're like, oh, my gosh, we did not get a picture with the piranha. Like, I've never caught a piranha before. Like, well, let's get another one. So we do this. Literally, cameras were down at that point. We're like, cool, iPhone photos. And I'm trying to, like, you can kind of peel the lip open just a little bit to show the teeth, and the thing just chomped the tip of my finger off. Oof. And there was so Oof. much blood. <laughs> I mean, so much blood everywhere. So we filmed all the aftermath, but, yeah. you know, that's one of those accidents that we talked Well, about. you forgot to mention that uh, I got a picture first successfully he did. showing the teeth. He did. And I didn't get bit, so... <laughs> I was been Piranha Bite is, man, those teeth are sharp. It's for real. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Technically, I've got to wrap up, but there's two of you. Can you make it quick? 
Let's do it. Come on, I'll give me the, the question. Let's go. Give it to us. If at all, how inspired by the crocodile hunter were you? How inspired by yeah. the crocodile hunter were you? Oh, hugely. I mean, everybody that, that came before us in creating content like this, I've seen every episode of anything that's ever been done. You'd have a really hard time stumping me when it comes to, do you know this guy that hosted shows? Um, but Steve was a huge inspiration for all of us. His charisma for wildlife and conservation, I mean, he set that bar, and it's yeah. a bar that will never be obtained. It's just how do you create a show that's inspired by him that can also reach generations of people to get them excited about animals. Awesome, well done. Last one, here we go. <laughs> Hi, um, so your channel actually inspired me and my sisters to like insects and bugs. So I can tell from your <laughs> spider out. <laughs> yes, guessed. so um, my little sisters aren't here right now. Their name is Elizabeth and Alana, and they would really love it if you can tell them to be brave and stay wild. So that would be a perfect closing. <laughs> Sure, Steve. Elizabeth and Alana? Elizabeth and Alana, yes. Okay, are you filming now? I am filming. Perfect. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Alana. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for watching Brave Wilderness, and stay tuned for Animal Planet. Brave the Wild comes out this February. Be brave, <laughs> stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Amazing. All right, everyone. That's all the time we have today. I want to thank you guys for coming. I want to thank you guys for having me. What a pleasure to be able to talk to you again. And big man. round of applause for Matt, because he's an amazing interviewer. This guy. Uh, but thank you. You're too kind. I hope you guys enjoyed the panel. A big thanks to everybody here. Thank you for being an awesome audience. Follow Animal Planet and Coyote Peterson on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram for more exclusive content and updates. The series is February 9th. Uh, lastly, it wouldn't be Comic Con without a giveaway. There's a poisonous arachnid under all of your seats. So be. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. There's bags. There's free bags. They don't bite. Grab a bag on the way out. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, one more time. Big round of applause for our guests. Thank, thank you, everyone. Exit that way, they're pointing. Okay.